really glad to have you here today. I know we're downstairs instead of upstairs, which is causing some confusion in the force, but we will find our way through. Um, and in future, because the session is about to start and we thought there might be a few more people here today, we wanted to meet downstairs, but for the, our regular meetings throughout the session, we'll be back upstairs in the community room. Um, we think those will likely be the third Saturday of the month, but we still have some scheduling confirming to do because the library meeting spaces are a hot commodity and we're negotiating with some folks. Um, so we were hoping to get started just by introducing ourselves and having everyone introduce yourself, um, your name, ideally what district in Brattleboro you live in, um, and then what brought you here today? More of a sentence, less of a paragraph, if that's possible. Um, so we have time for everyone. And then because the session's about to start, we'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're each planning um, and what we, how we expect the legislative session, which runs from January to May, to take shape. And then we're hoping to have a conversation with you. So I'm Emily Kornheiser, state rep from Brattleboro. I'm chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. And I'm really glad to be here with you all today. Good morning, I'm Tristan Tolino. Uh, I'm one of the other reps from Brattleboro, uh, and I serve on the House Appropriations Committee. And Molly Burke had a family emergency, and she's not able to be with us. She is the third member of our Brattleboro trio. Hi, everybody. I'm Nader Hashim. I'm one of the senators for Wyndham County. I serve as the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, and I'm also a member of the Education Committee, and I also serve as a member of the Judicial Nominating Board. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wendy Harrison. I'm the other senator uh, for Wyndham County. I live in Brattleboro. I serve on the Senate Economic Development, Housing, and uh, Affairs Committee. It's a long title. And um, on the Institutions Committee. And I'm also the Senate representative on the Public Transit Advisory Board. Good morning. John Woodland. Um, I live in Brattleboro in Molly Burke's um, district. And I am a representative of Third Act Vermont as well. Randy Holhut, news editor from the Commons. I live in Mike Maricki's district, and uh, good to see you all. I'm Joyce Marcel. I cover the legislature for the Commons. Can we go behind you? Oh, I'm Nancy <laughs> Hamilton, and I'm here out of real curiosity, and I'm in District 3. I'm Barb Pico. I'm in Tristan's district and also representing Third Act. Uh, I'm Susan Stafersky and I live in, in Molly's district. Right. Dave Lewis um, in West Brattleboro, uh, District 1. I'm Maggie Lewis from West Brattleboro and I'm here to listen. Alan Kornheiser. I do whatever my daughter tells me to do. <laughs> 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 um, I'm Nate King. Uh, in West Brattleboro, I don't know which district I'm in. I guess District 1? It's actually perhaps? technically District 7. 7? Oh, okay. okay, that's yes. good to know. Oh, wow. I'm Carol Davis, and I'm in Brattleboro in Tristan's district. And what brought you here today? Excuse me? What brought you here today? Because um, I want to know what can be done on the legislative level to make it less uh, inviting for drug dealers. I'm Mary Diane Baker. I'm in Tristan's district. Thank you. And I'm here because I didn't didn't know this, and it's nice to meet you uh, about the drug house problem, especially one in our neighborhood and all around town. Uh, Michael Bosworth, uh, District Seven, and uh, now active in uh, Third Act Vermont. Sarah Suckman in Emily's district, District 7, and I finally have a free Saturday and want to be here. Uh, Ken Fay, uh, I think I'm in Molly's district, and I'm here out of curiosity. Prudence McKinney, I'm in Emily's district, um, and I'm here interested in numerous issues um, and uh, Concerned about the drug activity, crime, um, but also uh, bicycle infrastructure and lots of stuff. Thanks. Uh, Tristan's district, which is what? Seven? Nine. Eight? Nine? 
Thank you. Right. I don't know. I just Window okay. nine. So it's <laughs> Friday Rail's old district three. Yeah, right? yeah. Thanks. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Tristan's district. Um, I uh, I am here. <laughs> I have a work hat, which probably is mostly not willing here, because I'll bug you about some of the environmental stuff later in other arenas, I'm sure. But also because I end up focusing so much on that stuff, I miss like everything else. So I would actually like to understand more like what are some of the other um, focuses that are coming up this year in the legislature. My name is Ernie Coughlin. Um, Seven. Uh, recently moved back here after growing up here many years ago, and I'm interested in many things. Thank you. And Kurt Kills. Oh, Kurt, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kurt Dimes. I'm with Brattleboro Common Sense. I'm here to hear what people say. Thanks. Um, and I just, it's not my district or Tristan's district, it's all of your districts, and I know that's like shorthand for the number, but I think it's really important um, that we are just sort of temporarily serving yeah. um, each of these districts, and they are in fact yours, so I'm gonna, uh, it's semantics, but it's also meaningful to me, so I have to say it. Um, who wants to kick off what we're doing this year? Um, how about I start, I'm gonna share first uh, something that Molly Burke wrote, uh, that she asked me to, or, uh, to read, but I've agreed to do so um, because she couldn't be here. Uh, this is a description of what her plans are, so I'm just going to read it straight. Um, it, she calls it her statement of intention for upcoming legislative session. She says, Dear all, thank you for coming to hear about our work for the coming legislative session. I'm sorry I can't be here in person, but I had to make an unexpected trip to attend to a family member with a challenging medical problem. In preparation for the upcoming session, I've been working with Representative Sarah Coffey of Gilbert, Chair of the Transportation Committee, to put forth proposals for inclusion in our omnibus transportation bill. Our prime motivation is to cut carbon emissions and help our communities weather future flooding events. We hope for extensive resilience planning, design, and implementation. We want to provide a variety of transportation options to help Vermonters to access jobs and to age securely in their communities. We want to improve public health and reduce transportation costs while reducing our carbon emissions. These are immediate and crucial undertakings that will require investment to meet our targeted emission reductions while addressing issues of equity and affordability. Vermont is currently not on target to meet our mandated emissions reduction goals. Our proposals are still being finalized, but we have a number of broad areas for inclusion. These include helping municipalities to plan for and adapt to climate change, accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles and ensure equitable access to affordable and reliable EV charging, expand public transit service to better serve all Vermonters, support more walkable and bikeable communities, address land use as it relates to availability of transportation options, address the sustainability of Vermont's transportation system to meet our emissions targets while maintaining and improving existing infrastructure. And along with my focus on transportation, I will of course be involved in the important issues related to mental health, housing, homelessness, and opioid, opioid use. At our next meeting, I'll have more to report on our progress in finalizing a transportation bill, as well, as well as many other challenges we face this legislative session. And just a reminder that you can find her uh, legislative email on the legislative website, and it is mburke at ledge.state.bt.us. And Molly um, was just awarded Legislator of the Year by the Sierra Club for a really a lifetime commitment to um, transportation issues and the environment. And the ceremony is actually, um, it's a statewide award, but it's at the marina next Saturday night if anyone wants to join and celebrate Molly. Yeah. And, go ahead. Uh, you, I'll come, you can come back, I was going to say, I'll come back to me for my personal update, but go ahead. Sure. All right. Thanks. So, hi again, everybody. Uh, so, I think I'll start by just talking about the two committees that I serve on and, you know, maybe uh, also cross over into some general uh, things that I want to work on moving into the future. So 
Um, as the Vice Chair of Judiciary, one of my main focuses is going to be addressing a lot of the inconsistencies that happen geographically uh, between our courts. Uh, I'm not going to get into the legalese and the semantics of it, but there are evidentiary standard uh, inconsistencies between different courts depending on which judge is sitting um, on the bench and uh, what standard they're deciding to use. And so, in my opinion, it creates this strange inconsistency where, you know, if you're going to court, uh, and, or let's say, you know, you, you got arrested a, a few feet over a county line and you go to court in one district, you may have a very different outcome as compared to if you were pulled over, you know, 20 feet into the other district. So that's one of the things that I'll be working on largely surrounding uh, bail hearings and hold without bail hearings. And also serve as a process. Um, right now, if you're trying to um, initiate a case, uh, you have to go through uh, either law enforcement or a, coin, a, sorry, or a court appointed official. Um, and this creates a very long uh, backlog with actually getting your case started in the first place. So um, a, a lot of other states have uh, professional process servers. Uh, we don't have that in Vermont. And so that's something that I'll be working on as well. Uh, the next piece that I've heard a lot about is uh, has to do with drug court, which is something that I've been working on for years. And it's been, you know, every, every time I feel like I'm making a little bit of progress on it, I run into a whole bunch of roadblocks. And I feel like, <clears throat> you know, knock on wood, we're actually getting somewhere this year. So. So I created a bill that will create two new judge positions, and I've been working closely with uh, the chief superior judge to make sure that one of these judge positions will be a float position for the drug docket. And if anybody has more questions as to what the drug docket is, I can uh, go deeper into that. But uh, this is something that would be statewide, so we wouldn't have to worry about, or wouldn't have to worry as much about uh, about the staffing issues when it comes to which judge is filling that position in which district. Uh, the other piece that I'll be working on is uh, more transparency for the Judicial Nominating Board. Uh, right now, it's, it's somewhat of a secretive process, and it's not intentionally, but it's, <clears throat> you know, it, it, people aren't aware of who is trying to become a judge until that person has made it almost all the way through the process. And in many other states, um, holding a position as a judge is, you know, it's, it's an elected position oftentimes. <coughs> and you know, right now, there is no room for public comment when, it, when somebody makes it through the judicial nominating process. So we'll be, so, so part of the plan is to make sure that the public from the very beginning is aware of who is trying to become a judge. And there'll also be um, an opportunity for public comment before that person is uh, approved in the Senate. And so I'll, I'll move on to education, uh, which is my afternoon committee. Uh, one of the top priorities has to do with PCBs and PCB remediation. So a lot of our schools uh, have some level of PCBs. And for those of you who don't know, PCBs are, uh, it's, it's essentially a chemical that over long-term exposure uh, can cause illness. And you know, similar to the PFAs that we saw in Bennington, uh, you know, the, the PCBs are, were commonly used in construction materials like sealants and caulk for windows and so on. <coughs> so right now, a lot of schools are going through the testing and uh, remediation process, and the costs are, I mean, in, in some cases, they can be pretty minimal. In other cases, they can be very high and so the program that we have provides that the state will pay 100% of the remediation cost as opposed to 80% as it was uh, last year and but the challenge is of course finding the money to uh, pay for that remediation so that it is not uh, shifted entirely onto the school boards um, to figure out where to find that money and the the next piece that I'm working on uh, came in light of uh, recent 
uh, development in Bellows Falls where literacy rates were found to be very low uh, among some freshmen, I believe. And myself and Senator Gulick, uh, we're, she's also a member of the Education Committee, uh, we're working on a bill that will require the Agency of Education to uh, create literacy screeners for grades K through 4. And, and, and these literacy screeners will look for or, or will try to determine whether or not the students are behind due to uh, a health issue like dyslexia or if they're behind due to uh, a, a lack of reading or a lack of exposure to books or you know, the, the teachers aren't you know, meeting the uh, standards that are needed for uh, teaching these kids to make sure that they're uh, literate at the, uh, to make sure that they're where they are supposed to be. And then, I feel like I've been talking for a while, so I'll just I'll wrap this up by just saying, mental health in schools is also another top priority, and that's something I'll be working on. There's, there's a whole long list of other issues, too. This isn't a comprehensive list. These are just some of the bullet points of some of the issues that I'll be working on. So, and I'll pass it. Shall I guess we go next? Sure. All right, well, welcome again, everyone. Um, I am going to be working on a lot of resiliency issues and it's just so important that we do that now while the floods are still in people's minds because um, the public doesn't always remember and it's just so important to, to get these projects done. Um, we brought the Economic Development Committee down here over the summer to see what Brattleboro has done in uh, floodplain restoration uh, at Melrose Place and then there's another uh, project happening up on Sawdust Alley and those projects really came through. Um, they, they reduced the, the flooding um, potential in Brattleboro tremendously. Now, we still need to do more, um, and to do more, we need more resources. So I have a bill to make it easier for towns to create what are called stormwater utilities. And what that is, is it's a mechanism where everyone pays something. So it even if you're tax exempt, you pay something if you generate stormwater off of your property because someone has to manage that stormwater. Uh, it's a fair way to, to pay for this because if you reduce your stormwater uh, generation, then you pay less. So there's an incentive for folks to, to keep stormwater on their property, the, the larger properties. It's relatively um, inexpensive. The, the costs are, are generally $50 a year in the places that have them. Um, there are towns who have them already, mostly all in Chittenden County, and they've put them in under duress uh, because their water quality uh, made them do it. But I wanna find a system where towns can do it, do it more easily, especially the small towns. Brattleboro has, uh, is investigating this, they're looking at it, but the smaller towns don't have staff. And so what I'm proposing is that we have an incentive, a financial incentive, for the small towns to work together. They would each still have their own utility, but they could get a, a common um, uh, uh, consultant to help them uh, establish it, because the complicated part is right in the, is in the beginning. So even though Brattleboro is in relatively good shape, it still needs to do more, but we are impacted by smaller towns, obviously upriver, um, and and it helps everyone if, if uh, we mitigate floods. So this, is a, this, would, um, this would apply to all of the towns outside of Chittenden County. And, um, and now's the time to do it. So that's, I'm gonna put a lot of effort into that. Um, just a kind of a detail thing, but it matters. Um, I'm pretty, I'm on the same page as Molly with, with public transportation and bike, uh, just alternative to cars because it benefits everyone. If you talk to doctors about medical access, uh, their patients have trouble getting to, to the doctor, getting to physical therapy. Um, so so um, public transportation, bicycle, walking, that's important for, for so many factors. Um, and it's important to have good amenities for uh, public transportation, to have signage, have benches, have shelters. And so um, there hasn't been a lot of good uh, coordination between towns and the transit uh, authorities. So I'm doing a bill to explicitly authorize towns 
when they're doing development review. So when there's a big development happening, they will be able to require bus amenities. Um, so it sounds <laughs> it sounds like a little detail, but it really it really could enhance the system, and and I'll be working on that. Um, I'm also working on, or I have, or I'm going to propose a bill to include lead abatement in the list of situations where a town can compel a property owner to take action. Because right now, when a property owner uh, puts, say, their um, tenants, especially children, in danger from lead, we don't have, in my opinion, good enough um, uh, responses to that. We have legal responses, but the courts are backed up. And the court process is necessarily long, just for fairness. Um, but we need to be able to, to stop that and take, take uh, action immediately. So this bill would allow towns to go in and remediate the lead when there is a problem. And, and for children, that's, that's critical. So that's one of my priorities. Um, generally, in uh, my, both of my committees actually, we're, we're going to be working on development review. So that's Act 250. We did a lot for housing last year. Um, we're going to do more um, working, uh, looking at Act 250, looking at, again at the court process because appeals can really slow things down. Um, we are making progress in housing. Brattleboro is actually a leader in housing. We've, we've done some, some great things here and much of our uh, goal is to make happen in the rest of the state what, is, what has and is happening in Brattleboro, just in terms of being able to have a duplex by right and being able to have um, uh, accessory dwelling units or, or tiny houses on, on your property um, and, and making it easy. Um, uh, reducing parking requirements because parking requirements have actually stopped a lot of uh, affordable housing especially um, programs in, in other towns. Um, and then just one more thing that I'm working on which is probably more relevant here, um, here in Winooski where we have a lot of um, new Americans. Uh, many of those folks come with really good uh, credentials and experience and I want to expand the credentialing that we did previously and um, get a study committee to work on credentialing of um, uh, medical doctors because uh, the state of Tennessee is doing some interesting, um, uh, they're, they're, they, they just passed a law on this um, so I'm getting the um, if, it, if the bill goes through, the credentialing folks, the hospitals, all, all of the relevant parties will be part of a, a study committee to see what we can do to harness the talents that we have um, without um, endangering patient safety, because obviously that's the most important thing. So it's going to be a fun four months. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I will jump in next. Um, my world's a little different. Uh, I sit on appropriations and in the House, and uh, it, it, so what we do <laughs> is uh, we sit and listen to a lot of presentations about money. Um, I think 65 presentations from the administration uh, in about four and a half weeks on, with every different budget from every different department and agency of state government, um, and then also testimony from uh, people who are stakeholders who are interested in the outcomes of some of those budgets and so uh, we don't get out of the room much it's kind of a running joke in the building certainly on the house side we don't reappear until we pass our budget in March um, I'm interested in a lot of the policies yes. um, I'm interested in a lot of the policies that are coming up and I think Emily's going to talk some more about some, more in depth about some that uh, I'm particularly interested in. But my role will be very much to support that through the budgeting part of the process as well. Uh, specific, of specific interest to me within the Appropriations Committee process, and I think relevant for all of us who care about making Vermont a better place to live and work, is uh, that we made a lot of decisions to fund and create programs that depend on employees in state government to exist and to be well trained and to be well supported to do the to do the work of delivering those programs and services. And 
you know, we started in January last year, we had a 12% vacancy rate in state government. We know that the workforce crisis is systemic, it's national, it's regional, it's in Vermont statewide, and then it's also affecting every sector of the economy, including state employment. And there's something beyond that that's important for us to understand, and this is um, something that interests me very greatly, which is that we, uh, we, I started to see in the data evidence that there are systemic pressures in how we have organized state government that we're not talking about. And what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, the, the in-state government supervisors and or employees can say, hey, I'm doing a different job than you hired me for and that should be reevaluated. And in a typical year, that might happen 500 times in, a, in, a, in the entire system. Last year, by midway through, we were at nearly double that rate. And that's a sign that, that, that we're having to adapt and put pressure on individuals that is probably unreasonable, unfair, and extraordinarily demotivating, uh, leading people to retire because they just can't put up with it anymore. And where that shows up for us is, you know, if you're waiting three hours to reach somebody at economic services to find out whether you have a, 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 a bed to sleep in tonight uh, on Tim, a cold night. Tim, there's a night. chair right here for you. Yeah, come on in. You know, or whether you're putting a permit application in, or you know, all kinds of different places where, where the quality of the supports that we have to help all of us do our, you know, live our lives here is dependent on state employees being able to meet us well, and those state employees are being stretched to the breaking point. It's inhumane, and it, we won't hire our way out of it without addressing whether this is a structural problem or not. And so I don't know what the answer is yet in terms of our responsibility and role as legislators to figure this out, um, but it's very much something that I'm motivated to try to take on. I've been for almost 10 years in my legislative work on the State Workforce Board. I've been thinking about workforce a lot. I created the draft bill structure that became our biggest workforce package in a number of years, two years ago. Um, and so I feel like I probably am the one uh, in the best position to try to help surface this issue and we'll see where we can go with it. But we all should care that state government which historically has five or six percent vacancy is possibly operating at double that um, because of, of what it's doing across the system. Um, there are other sort of in the weeds things that happen that are of interest to me um, around uh, contracting. So state government does two different things. We have state employees doing services and then we also contract with a whole network uh, of service providers and in many cases those are performance contracts, and I'm putting the, the air quotes around it for, for kind of a, a, an intentional reason, which is that they're often performance contracts that are the same dollar amount year after year. Uh, and while there Can are- Can I give an example? Sure. So SEVCA and Groundworks and EES and the um, Adult Day and any of sort of your like community nonprofits that you think about as serving like basic community functions, they have one of these contracts. They're essentially doing the work of government on behalf of government, but in our community and under one of these contracts. Thank you. You're That's welcome. perfect. And so what I'm seeing in our appropriations process is that they are, we don't directly talk about them. We talk about the global budgets that the administration then uses to contract for those services. But if we aren't looking at them and studying whether that's the right decision or not, we're basically kind of complicit in those services being starved of resources over time if we're not adjusting them. Um, and more and more, some of those individual service providers who are bigger or have resources to come in and advocate for changes are getting kind of one-off deals from legislators who are able to influence the process, but we're not looking at that systemically. So this, this has a lot to do with how we experience the investments that we make on the behalf of all Vermonters who have you know, raised the money to make these investments in the kind of services that we think will benefit uh, us all. And it's, it's, so it's in the weeds, but it's crucially important. Um, and then I will tee it over to Emily. Thank you.
Um, so we can pass the best laws in the world, and you know, occasionally we do, often we don't. Um, it's all a deeply imperfect process. But none of it will make any difference at all if it's not being administered well. And some of that not administered well is um, you know, national systemic issues around workforce shortages. And much of it is sort of a long-standing trend to defund government. And in all of those cases, I think ev all of us are experiencing a bit of a breaking point in our experience of government, whether that is trying to get a permit for building and not having a partner when you're walking through that permitting process with state government, whether that is trying to get mental health support for a family member in crisis, but I think we've all experienced that sort of fraying of government's ability to function. And we do not have a partner in the governor in trying to solve this problem, though it is a problem of governance and administration less than a problem of legislation. And so we're in this really interesting position that I think Tristan described um, very well. My um, role as the chair of Ways and Means um, means that I sit on like a dozen different joint oversight committees in different areas um, because as sort of the person who thinks about how we create revenue in the state, my job is to make sure that we are adequately resourcing all of our policy initiatives. And so this year, the focus of um, our caucus and I believe of sort of the House as a whole are going to be in like three really key focus areas. And for me, it feels to some ways like the culmination of the work that we've been trying to do to represent Brattleboro well for a really long time. So there's a few areas here that I feel like we've been sort of screaming from the depths of a hole about down here in Brattleboro. And finally, the state's like, oh yes, that is a problem that we should solve. And so that feels really, really exciting, and I'm glad to tell you about it today. So one of them is housing. As Wendy said, we have actually, in Brattleboro, done basically like all the work that's possible at a town level to make this possible. We have reformed every piece of zoning we can. We have really fantastic collaboration amongst our community partners, which many other areas don't. We tend, as a community, to say yes to affordable housing, to mixed income housing, to any kind of housing. We tend to be very compassionate to our neighbors that don't have housing. We put community resources towards this. And yet still, it is very clearly not enough for any of us. There is not enough housing for older Vermonters. There is not enough housing for low-income Vermonters. Not that those are mutually exclusive categories. There is not enough housing for Vermonters with disabilities. I think I can go on and on. And so we are going to focus on, yes, significant <coughs> zoning reform, including the administration of that planning and zoning. We're going to focus on making more money available for new housing construction. Through, ideally through fully funding the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. That's where how money gets to Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. We're going to reform our shelter system, including the motel system, which in an ideal world is the backup backup, because it is not a perfect place for anyone to live. But if someone does need to live there, they should get both the resources that they need, the services they need, and the dignity of a clean, safe, hygienic environment that is properly overseen and regulated given that state dollars are going to it. And so we're going to focus sort of across that continuum of housing, and that feels to me like finally what Brattleboro's needed for a long time is getting the attention of all of our colleagues. We're also going to focus on community safety and public health. And that includes a lot of what Nader described and is working on in terms of reforming our justice system so that we don't have long delays in court processing, so that when we have immediate justice, we are much more likely to see it actually as a deterrent to crime. And I think at our last, somewhere that I was with, with Nader, you described that in some detail. Um, we're also going to focus on strengthening our mental health system, both in our schools, where we're seeing a lot of school budget money is being spent on mental health when ideally that should be carried by our mental health system. And I can get into the weeds on that. And then focusing on drugs and drug use. And I don't want to just say opioids anymore because the drug crisis um, throughout the state is absolutely not just opioids because every substance that someone is using is a really like mixed bag of substances that um, often are not are resistant to some of the treatments like Narcan that we um, can help revive people. 
And so Vermont was once a leader in the hub and spoke system. I don't know if everyone remembers, like we were in Rolling Stone, Shumla was considered incredibly courageous. We created this amazing treatment system. It is very clearly not working at all anymore. And so what we need to do is begin to think about this differently. We need to make sure that folks are staying alive long enough to get the support they need. We need to make sure that when people do seek support and do seek treatment, that it actually lasts long enough to make a difference, and that when people exit intensive treatment, they have community supports in place for them. And so we are putting forward a number of bills from overdose prevention centers to better mental health drop-in centers to extending treatment and making sure that Medicaid is covering what Medicaid needs to cover for all of that. And so I feel really excited about that work. Um, and that's really like, we've seen a sea change over the last five years, honestly, as more and more of us have lost loved ones. Um, that is really where the difference, that's what took, what it took to make a difference and um, it's devastating actually. Um, and then government accountability is really the other big one. Um, and Tristan I think described that very clearly. We are leaving significant federal money on the table um, that we are not drawing down to use our state resources for. We are funding really fantastic programs that are not being implemented adequately. And our schools, which have tremendous needs right now, and our kids have tremendous needs right now, and our teachers and support staff are working very hard, are not being adequately resourced by the Agency of Education so that they can use the funding that they have as efficiently as possible. So as we sort of look across all of those priorities and systems, we're gonna need money to meet those needs. And some of that, as I said, is drawing down federal resources. Some of that is looking at our school taxation and our property taxation system to make it more equitable. We've done a lot towards that. About two thirds of Vermonters pay for their school taxes based on their income, not based on the value of their property. But it's not enough and many of us are feeling very stretched. Um, and so we need to find ways to raise the revenue that we need for government to function efficiently and adequately um, to serve all of us. And so we're beginning some conversations about what it looks like to pass a real wealth tax in Vermont. I'm working with some national experts who did um, drafting in California and Washington State and New York State, um, as well as working on Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders wealth tax bills. And so we're gonna see what it might look like to be able to do that in Vermont so we can actually meet the needs that we have here. We, you know, I recently saw some coverage. It's possible West Brattleboro is actually the, um, somehow the poorest census block in the state. I was very struck by that um, because of how well we take care of each other um, and sort of the face we all put on as we go out into the world. But our neighbors are struggling every day and government needs to work so we can all thrive. Um, and so there's you know, huge parts of economic development that to make that work, to make this a place where folks can build when we have everyone adequately resourced, when schools work, um, when we have social infrastructure that's funded, like family medical leave, like the incredible childcare bill we passed last year. When all of that happens, it means that wages can be higher and businesses are less strapped in their own HR capacities so that the economy actually grows and strengthens more. So that's what I am gonna be working on this year. I'm really excited about it. Some of that is deep in the weeds of like modernizing how we appraise properties so we can understand what is and isn't a second home. And some of that's like big, fun, splashy stuff, like talking about what is wealth and what does it even mean to be fair and equitable with our resources as a state. And I'm excited to do it with this really great team I was recently talking to another colleague about something fairly in the weeds of state policy, and he asked me my opinion on it, and I said it, he said, oh my goodness, Tristan Tolino said the exact same thing to me word for word, and it was something that we had actually never had a conversation about. Um, so really feel like you know the five of us do good by all of you in the way we collaborate with each other, the way we collaborate with our congressional delegation, um, and really the renewed efforts to collaborate with the select board and the school board here. So. I will stop there. Thank you. Um, questions, thoughts? That's what we're here for. Yes.
John. Not really a question, but I'd like to comment. Um, I mentioned very briefly earlier that um, I'm with Third Act Vermont. I'm the volunteer coordinator for the group. We have about 550 people in our database at this point, um, and it's continuing to grow. I think we're probably pretty much on the same page um, with most issues, uh, and we can be a resource for you um, to try and create pressure. We can get emails out to people quickly and say, hey, this is coming up, contact your legislature, and there are people all over the state. Um, the things we're specifically concerned about, obviously, I think I've already mentioned it in the past here, we want to get S42 out passed and passed veto proof for those who don't know it what? by the number. That's, yeah, that's the um, divestment bill forcing the state pension funds to divest from fossil fuel. Um, we're interested in a, a good, solid, progressive, renewable um, energy standard, and that means um, counting all the life cycle um, carbon costs that go with a particular fuel. Um, we're interested in the legislation that I understand is floating around somewhere about make big oil pay um, and thermal energy networks. Um, we're obviously interested in transportation, which um, has been discussed before. And I have the good fortune of being able to talk to Molly about quite a bit. Um, and we are also interested in the democracy issues as well. Um, so those are all places we can help you. Uh, again, I doubt we're on a different page in many places, but um, we'd be happy to try and support your work. Thank you. And I actually left off um, a project that we're working on across the house on um, essentially setting up a climate resiliency fund that would fund things like wastewater, like renew renewable energy for communities. Um, you know, often when we build sidewalks, that's a separate project from when we build roads, which is a separate project from when we build wastewater, which is a separate project. And all of that needs to be done in a way that's both resilient and forward thinking about carbon emissions reductions. And we're hoping to capitalize that fund with a combination of the Make Big Oil Pay, um, with a surcharge on insurance um, that will eventually go down because insurance companies will be saving money if we do this well and um, with conversations with the treasurer about the best way to think about how we're managing our investments. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, this is really interesting, so I'm glad you guys are doing this but, and continue to do it, but um, I guess um, one of the things that I haven't heard talked about much is affordability of living in Vermont, and that has, big implications for being able to attract people to come here and work. And that's really important for us to be a viable state, a viable community. So I just, I, I'm sure that you think about this, but workforce housing is really important in the housing mix as well. And um, and then, you know, I have no idea how you do this because there's so much need and not enough money, but, um, but, but Vermont's a super expensive place to live and, um, and that hurts a, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so Prudence asked about affordability and what that means for um, folks in the back who are. Um, so Vermont, in a number of different studies, Vermont actually is around the same price to live as surrounding areas. Our wages are much lower than surrounding areas. Um, and so one big lever for increasing wages is the largest employer in Vermont is the state and the state's contracted entities. And so we, we're in a little bit of a funny um, bubble with that, in that one reason that wages are so depressed is because um, its state contracts pay so little, right? If you work for any nonprofit in the area, you're often not making a living wage, and that's the state that is sort of underfunding that. Um, but a lot of it is that our businesses need support to grow in order to pay higher wages, right? And a lot of, in a small business, the cost of benefits is often absolutely impossible to cover um, because you don't have the efficiencies of scale, it, like in terms of your risk pool and all of that. And so I believe that in Vermont, one of the best ways we can get to affordability is to make sure that those extra costs of benefits around health insurance, around um, family medical leave insurance, around childcare, 
um, even around, say, um, down payments for homes and mortgage support, that all of that can be covered at the state level so the businesses don't need to cover it themselves because a four-person organization can't pull off that kind of like benefits to be competitive with national employers. If I could, yeah, yeah, I just want to follow through on that. It's, it, the challenge of affordability is that all, it's, a, it's a word that can uh, lead people to, to think of their own, their own definition in a really potent way. And, and yet, I think probably at some very large level, I think we all agree that that, that can be improved. Um, to me, the leverage points are housing and, and wages. And, um, and we're, I don't think there's any way to sugarcoat it. We, as a state, underinvested in housing, not at just at the state level, but private dollars underinvested in housing for 30 years. And what that has done is the amount of our income that goes to housing is out of control. And our wages are lower than our region. Um, so that's another thing, but also it has made our population stagnant and older. And so, you know, that, what that does for employers is like, it's hard to find the employees to expand. If you have business opportunity and you can't find people to do it, it's hard to grow at the level that you could. And if you're not growing, it's hard to create wage growth because you're not in a, you know, financially robust place. And so these competing dynamics are happening very systemically and um, and so as much as it is uh, a slow leverage point I think housing in all forms is is crucial um, my personal bias is towards leveraging uh, as much quick as we can to reduce the emergency level of the problem because it's going to consume so much of our state resources that could be going to the longer term if we're not dealing with the short-term emergency. It's just an extremely expensive way to address the problem, but the basics of humanity, like we have to do this, this is not an option. Um, you know, the, the, the social impacts for, for the individuals, but also for the community as a whole. Uh, if, you know, we saw that this summer when we started to have fewer people eligible for emergency housing and no available housing. You know, like we saw it everywhere. Every, I assume probably all of us have experienced that in some way that is hard. And that's nothing like what the people who are experiencing that is, you know, in their own lives are experiencing. So we know we have to address it. Um, but, but we have to focus on these long-term leverage points and really do something different. And, and I'm going to say something that, you know, I, I, I have an MBA in sustainability. I've cared about that as an issue for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of people who are attracted to zero growth models or to you know, say that population growth is a fundamental problem. But it's not necessarily a blanket statement that we can actually live into. It needs to be smart population growth. And we, the, the, the lack of population growth in Vermont means that fewer people are covering the cost of state government. Fewer people are here who have disposable income to support the local businesses that build a you know, high quality of life. Those businesses don't have a thriving business model that allows them to lift up the wages in the area. And, and, and so that combined with this high level of housing cost, we're in a little bit of a trap. It's a demographic trap that we're in and Wyndham County is among the most vulnerable parts of the state. And so something has to change and, and I hope that we are able to go big on the housing side now and I hope that we continue to talk as a community about how do we actually meaningfully co-contribute, not just ask the state government, but co-contribute to that change uh, because it really will take all of us uh, actively working on these kinds of uh, changes. I also just wanted to follow up real quick um, on the point about <coughs> about appealing uh, to folks to move to the state and, and stay here. And, you know, in both judiciary and then education, two very different sectors of society and government, the same, we, we hear the same concerns about housing and affordability when we're talking about 
um, you know, having lawyers filling positions in you know, the Defender General's office or the State's Attorney's office or really anywhere. And then you know, we also hear the same exact thing when it comes to education and you know, finding teachers to fill positions. Uh, or, you know, we, we are able to find teachers here and there. It's tough, but it's happening. However, there are a number of instances where teachers are accepting jobs, they're excited to move here, and then they have to go back on their contract because they just can't find anywhere to live. So it is something that we're uh, very aware of in, in those committees as well. And uh, you know, one of the things that I'll also be working on is actually some uh, student loan repayment programs for both uh, teachers, um, school staff, and attorneys as well, new attorneys um, who are just starting out either they're in their third year of law school or they're starting their internship or their clerkship and you know providing stipends to those folks while they're just getting out of college is a great way for them to uh, you know, set up roots here and you know once you start setting up roots and you're you know working at a you know at the defender general's office for example you start you know making friends and you, you know you're, and you're living here you're less likely to leave is, is what I've seen so that's, that's what's on my mind. Yeah, and let me just, yep. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, on the workforce uh, uh, efforts, yeah, we hear about that in economic development, because we do. Um, we did do some, we, we did make some changes uh, last year, and now there are incentives for folks who have just graduated to, to stay in Vermont. So yes, we totally agree, we talked about that, um, about how once people get here, and um, see Vermont and love Vermont, um, then that's the perfect time to, to have an incentive for them to stay here. And then I just want to mention a bill that we did last year that was very hard, I thought was S5, the clean heat standard. And many of the, much of the housing costs are, are heat and oil heat and just the, um, the variability and the expense of, of heating with oil. So, so we put in incentives to get people off of oil and uh, it, especially low-income people off of oil, and, and that over time should, should make a, a, um, a big chunk of, of that cost go down. And livable, walkable communities mean that you can have one car instead of two cars. Um, so if, if we keep the development patterns that we already have and, and make things more livable and have good transit, like have transit go later in the evening so that you can get home from work, have it be on Saturdays and Sundays, and other places in Vermont are doing that. Um, that also can can help folks have one car instead of two cars or no cars, which is which is a real benefit to uh, affordability. It's you know it's the way you Wendy can bring anything back to transportation. I can bring anything back to taxes. Okay. And um, totally. <laughs> I, I just want to say you know like the last few years of inflation since the beginning of the pandemic has also seen record record corporate profits. So it's not as if this is natural growth in prices, even in housing, it's we're seeing record corporate gains because of investments, purchases of housing and price gouging there. We've seen price gouging at the motels to house our most vulnerable. And we've seen price gouging at the grocery store by multinational corporations. And we've done a huge amount of work in Vermont, and I'm going to continue to do that work this year, to reform how we tax corporations to making sure that that money is coming back to Vermonters every day. Even if they're not based in the city? If they make a sale, the way we tax corporations, it's actually if they make a sale in Vermont is where their corporate um, nexus is. It's not whether or not they're headquartered here. So actually, Vermont businesses that are headquartered here actually have a tax benefit compared to businesses that are just sort of you know, selling and breaking profits off of us. Other questions? Have you considered the, um, you know, the increase in remote workers? Um, you know, being able to work, you know, as long as there's housing here, they could still live here and have a job in another state, but still, you know, live here and pay taxes and, you know, enjoy it. And then what happened with the, um, the incentive? There was an incentive that was um, a program that the governor put together to pay people and incentivize them to move here. The incentive was actually a, a brainchild I believe the Senate Economic Development yes. Committee um, a number of years ago. It um, in that first year it garnered a lot of headlines nationally, and so um, might have worked that first year. Uh, um, at this point, the headlines are over. 
um, and we're just seeing, the, it was in the last few years that it was operating, it was essentially paying people who were already planning to move here to move here. Um, some businesses were using it as sort of part of a um, recruitment package, which was an effective way to, I think, use those state resources. But at this point, we've seen a huge number of people moving here with jobs um, other places. And so like, there's an actual pretty constant flow now of people moving to Vermont um, actually, with remote jobs. Thank you. I moved here two and a half years ago. I'm a remote worker. Um, and I absolutely love it here. But to the affordability, as Emily knows, I have emailed her, it's a little high. Um, compared to where I used to live, which was Philadelphia, to the drug problem, trust me, you don't have, we don't, we have it bad, but we don't have it as bad as it can be, because I'm from the Kensington neighborhood, and I'm sure you've all seen those videos online, and it can get really bad, but there is work to be done. Um, but yes, so I fit this demographic everybody's talking about, I just felt I should speak up here, um, and it is high to live here. I'm not leaving unless I can't afford it. If I can't afford it, I'm leaving. Um, but I, my wife and I put our roots here and we plan on staying here as long as possible. So your wages are probably lower than what you were getting, right? Or, no, or not, I, not I, because I, you're I, remote. My in Texas. Yeah. My wages okay. don't have anything to do with okay. living in Vermont, um, which is a benefit to being remote working. But I can tell you this, if I wasn't a remote worker, I would still be living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I would have never left that city. Um, there's no way, I'm in web development. There are no web development jobs here. And if there are, they're paying pennies compared to the national average. Um, you know, I, I've seen some here and there for $20 an hour. You can go work at a fang company for 300K a year. You know, like, you know, Vermont isn't competing, especially the tech sector. I want to. I got an email recently from someone that sort of started with, "Oh, you've you've already forgotten what it's like to, you know, to work." Um, and I just, you know, like we get emails like this. This is how it goes. And I just want to like make sure everyone in this room knows, like, we make thirteen thousand dollars a year as legislators, and so like we all really get it. <laughs> um, we get what it's like to try to pay your bills here in Brattleboro with low wages and high costs. Yes. Uh, I, I didn't introduce myself at first because I'm working. I'm Matt. I live uh, uh, in on Canal Street, whichever district that is these days. I can't remember. But um, I moved to Brattleboro in 2002 as um, doing a few days of long distance commuting and uh, else being remote. And it was at my wife and I buying our first house. It was absolutely for quality of life, life reasons, moving from the broad Boston area. Um, and about some number of years later, I discovered that doing the long distance drive even a couple of days a week wasn't working out for me. I tried doing remote work for a while and also discovered that remote work wasn't working for me as a full-time thing and had to take quite a significant pay cut when I got a job in my community. Fortunately, I love it and we've been able to make it work and the folks here at the library and the town have been supportive in recognizing some of the things I bring here. But, you know, definitely to your point, right, you know, I moved, I was in the tech sector, moved here with a remote job and when I looked, needed to look for something local, you know, I basically had to, you know, go back to the, uh, started with a wage that I hadn't earned since I was a co-op student in college. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's hard, but, but it's worth it too. Sorry, I didn't see Oh, sorry. Thoughts, ideas, questions? Yeah. Um, I wondered if there's a legislation up for vote this session to make breaking into vehicles against the law. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I thought it was a beautiful call on. Give me this last thing. If it's locked, it's breaking. If it's unlocked, it's not breaking in that room. Yes. So Isn't that, doesn't that go back to like when it's cold out, if you needed to get, like, because I know in Canada they have laws where you leave your cars unlocked in case you need to get somewhere warm. Or, you know. So if, if your car is unlocked and somebody goes into it and takes a nap, that isn't illegal. Uh, that is that is the current, or you know, if they rummage around for your stuff, it's, it's not a crime. Uh, if the car is locked and the person damages it to get inside of the vehicle, then that is a crime. 
and what are we changing on the books? What are we that's the law that's on the books he just that's, described. Yeah. yeah, what I just described is on the books. What's so what are we proposing? The proposal is to make it so that if somebody enters your car um, and it's unlocked and, and they're just going through your car, it's considered trespassing. Um, and it's not necessarily up for a vote. There are hundreds and hundreds of bills that are sponsored and sit um, on actually like push pinned to walls in various committee rooms. Very few of those bills come up for a vote. But there does seem to be there, yes. cross party interest in making this change, so we'll see what happens. Hi. Um, so one of the things you talked about was. Um, the humanitarian responsibility of our community and how, as a majority, we all support one another within this community. And we have an infrastructure to do that, which is great, and so we can capitalize on that. When we're looking at Wyndham County as a whole, I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, but Brattleboro holds that responsibility um, inequitably as compared to the rest of the county. And I'm wondering, how you all can help facilitate other communities outside of Brattleboro who have infrastructure to further develop their commitment to Wyndham County in that humanitarian responsibility. So um, I, in my paid work world, I actually facilitate one of my many gigs is um, I facilitate the Wyndham, the Southeast Vermont Housing Coalition. Um, which is a collaboration between the sort of directors of all of the various organizations throughout the county that think about housing, whether that's economic development or um, directly housing. And that group, along with groups that are essentially the same all over the state, there's one in each county, um, is really focused on making sure that partners are sort of coming to the table from, very, from every town, and that each town is sort of developing a housing committee of some kind. Um, that is not legislative, but it's an initiative of sort of statewide housing partners to make sure that all, every town and every community is working on it. Legislatively, um, there's a lot that's being done right now to make sure that communities can't say no, really, right? Um, so what we've seen as affordable, as we've tried to develop affordable housing in places outside of Brattleboro, is the community outcry can be quite intense. Um, and there was a really great article in the comments, actually, about homelessness in Putney itself. Because I think a lot of our neighbors have a story that all of this is actually just a Brattleboro problem. Not just that it's a Brattleboro responsibility, but it's a only a Brattleboro problem. Because the face of homelessness is so different when folks are sleeping in their cars or sleeping in uninsulated campers or you know, um, in shacks in the woods. And so there's a, all of the zoning reform that we're doing should make it much easier to build affordable housing. We did get asked by the town um, to be thinking about something that happens in California where each town actually has a legal mandate. Um, I would be happy to do that. I can't fathom that would ever pass in Vermont. Um, we, the sort of town's rights um, side of the conversation is so important to so many of our colleagues. Um, and to me on some days. Um, and so I like I really just, I mean, I would be happy to try for that, but I think it's a long shot. I wanted to yeah. add two layers. Uh, so one is this data is a couple years old, but it's from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Uh, and I just looked at the beltway around Brattleboro towns. And uh, in their database of affordable rental housing in the Brattleboro area, uh, Vernon had 78 units, Putney had 63, they're trying to add more. Halifax had zero, Marlboro had zero, Guilford had 24, Dummerston had zero, and Brattleboro had 868 um, of the, of the 1,000. And uh, so that, you know, right away it's like, wow, that doesn't seem fair. On the other hand, <laughs> when affordable housing is built too far away from where the jobs and the services are, that puts in tremendous pressure. So we, we need to do both, you know, and I think that that's part of what is a statewide conversation about like how do we balance both. I see you wanted to come back into the conversation, so yeah, please do. The towns of Wellington and Dover in that also who also have the infrastructure. They have they have healthcare there. They have grocery stores there. Right. 
they have the tax base that they could help afford affordable housing and meet the needs of the community and there's public transportation that runs between Brattleboro and that area so and I didn't pull the data for that and I apologize yeah, I, if I'm I, sorry, I you know no that's fine I I should I should add that to my database just to, to expand it and so this is the tension I think that we hold which is that you know we how to make sure that we actually meaningfully grow the number of housing units where it makes sense, where there's already wastewater, where there's already infrastructure, where we're not putting people in a position of getting into housing situations that make it harder for them to afford to live here in, in an ironic twist. So The other piece of that, especially if you're thinking about Wilmington, Dover, Marlboro, Townsend, um, you know, Vermont has a higher proportion of vacation homes to um, primary homes than anywhere else in the country. And so if we could, again, to bring it back to taxes, um, <laughs> the more we can do to make sure that our um, property tax policy is really supporting um, lowercase a affordable rentals and primary homes, I think the more we'll be creating more space for housing, um, especially workforce housing in the Wilmingtons and Dovers and Townsends of the county. I think and that'll take some pressure off Brattleboro. I think it's, 20, it's like 27 to 30 percent in Wyndham County is second home. Yeah, but it's like 70 percent in Londonderry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but let me add just a yeah. couple things. Yeah. Um, so there is probably more affordable housing, like uh, uh, officially affordable housing in those other towns, especially in uh, Bellows Falls and in Putney, than is visible. Um, there were some developments that went in 30 years ago in, in uh, downtown Bellows Falls that are affordable housing, and there was a new project just last year, uh, the, the Bellows Falls um, garage, that's just a wonderful project. Um, and there, there are also individual homes that are uh, affordable because they're shared equity homes where the housing trust owns the property and the uh, individual owns the uh, house and and it, it stays affordable forever because of, of that relationship um, Putney does have two other um, affordable housing uh, developments and the town has actually been very supportive of the the new development um, there's there's there was a um, town-wide vote for the select board, and it was very clear which members were running, supported the housing, and those were the ones who, who were elected by a, a big margin. So the town as a whole does support affordable housing, or, or that uh, particular um, development, I should say. And um, the, the issue there is really the appeals process that's in the Act 250 and in local zoning too and so that's something that we're going to continue to work on um, and then one of the good things there are good things about Act 250 is it does require in some cases that um, like the ski resorts for example Mount Snow has had to provide funding for affordable housing in its Act 250 permit so that's something that we need to make sure remains in the in the process because if say if Dover or any community was the only one who was permitting a ski, a ski resort, you might not consider uh, affordable housing, but, but Act 250 does consider it in their process, and they do make requirements for funding uh, affordable housing. And so there is some there, not enough, obviously, because uh, actually most of their employees come from this side of the town, too. So again, traffic. <laughs> Um, because you raised the Act 250 uh, question, I am a big fan of Act 250, <laughs> and I'm really afraid that it's going to get destroyed because of uh, the pressure to build housing. I think a lot of uh, developers and contractors are going to take advantage of this, and Phil Scott, um, who hates Act 250. <laughs> are going to take advantage of the housing problem to destroy the act. And I was wondering how you guys felt about that. I felt really, um, I think a lot of what gets blamed on Act 250 is um, 
even national zoning and planning laws and clean water laws that passed federally after Act 250 passed. And I have gotten this talking point from Liz McLaughlin and she just walked in, so I want to give her credit for it. Um, and so a lot of what we sort of blame on Act 250 is the result of like really poor communication in the planning process by state government. Um, and so there's a lot that could be done to sort of just strengthen regulation in terms of like who is doing the regulating and how good a job they do regulating. I think that makes a huge difference. Um, and I think when we do look to reform Act 250, the downtown and village center designation um, and the ability of towns to do their own planning and zoning, I think is a real opportunity where we could create some more space um, and carve out from Act 250 there. So Brattleboro has, you know, spent a decade doing like really deep planning and zoning reform that's considered like sort of national best practices, but can't actually use those national best practices because there's like this extra layer of state control on it. Um, so I would love to see sort of a, um, the best you can do, like, what is, I don't even know the word for what I'm trying to describe. Like, if you're doing, if a town has model policies um, and a model ability to implement those policies, then they can get a carve out. But I think as a state, we shouldn't allow, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I actually made a binder, I should bring it here, that shows <laughs> like, the amount of a typical permit, it's, it's in a different color, it's green pages as opposed to white pages. But most of, of what is there would be required anyway, um, uh, particularly wetlands, stormwater, um, the the develop and the developers know this. The the professional developers know this, um, but people don't like to be regulated. Um, you know, <laughs> most developers don't want any sort of regulation. So so Act 250 is is a convenient target, mm -hmm. and I agree that it's there are some really good protections um, that uh, Act 250 has, and and there there's a lot of support in in the legislature for for keeping those protections. Uh, which is important. Um, it's going to be a very complicated conversation because there are three different proposals now um, that I've seen to um, change the system, to change Act 250. Some delegate to municipalities who can handle it, but it's not a it's not a true delegation that the municipal most municipalities don't want to be responsible for everything. Um, that Act 250 does. So you would still need some um, uh, regulation of that or, or some supervision. Um, we're, we're talking about river corridors because if, if you're familiar with the way it's governed now, towns govern the river <coughs> corridors. And of course, many towns were um, settled on rivers. That's the, you know, how all of civilization actually um, developed. And you don't want people rebuilding in floodplains, right? That's pretty basic. Um, but we're leaving that to individual towns. We don't have good mechanisms or alternatives. Um, in my opinion, that should really be a state. And, and I'm all, <laughs> I'm, I'm a very much a, uh, a local government. Um, and and uh, uh, I want as much power at the local level as possible. But if you look at rivers, they cross boundaries. They don't care about um, town lines. Um, and and the impacts are across boundaries. So so river corridors really need to be managed by the state, and that towns can can just be fine with that. It it doesn't have to be done in a way that that's going to hurt towns, um, and it would be much more logical. And so that's what I'm going to um, uh, support when we get to these conversations. But it's it's going to be interesting, and and so you know keep. Stay in touch because <laughs> it's, it's going to change day by day. And there are there are times when um, people like being regulated, right? Um, and I think there's probably we all have at least one place in our life where we like that something that we do is regulated. And Vermont actually is a global leader in captive ins the captive insurance industry, and we make a lot of state revenues and bring it back to taxes again on the captive insurance industry. And the reason we are a global leader in is actually because we regulate it so well. Um, our regulators are collaborative, but have very high standards. 
And that is, could be a model for the rest of state government. In fact, the employees at the Department of Financial Regulation who regulate captive insurance are also some of the happiest employees in state government <laughs> right. because they are doing a good job, they are qualified for their job, and they're paid well for it. And so all of, like, regulation does not have to be bad. It just has to be well done and well resourced. Right. I also wanted to yeah. just quickly answer the uh, Act 250 question. You know, a few years back, uh, before I started actually you know, getting into the details and the weeds about it all, uh, I thought Act 250 was also, you know, the main problem and that it was something that needed to change in a big way. But, you know, as I've learned over the years, it's, it's not necessarily Act 250. There's a lot of other moving parts to it, you know, like zoning, for example, and a lot of the other points that Emily brought up earlier. And I think that, you know, on the, you know, looking at it from a higher level, Act 250 is one of the contributing reasons that Vermont is appealing in the way that it is right now. And it's why we, we get folks from, you know, all across the country who want to live here. And so that's all to say, I don't want to just suddenly get rid of Act 250. Just to make sure I answer your question. I just wanted to add one more thing to this policy discussion on Act 250, which I agree with almost everything that people said. But there's one more thing, and that's administratively. I think the state could do a better job of actually sticking to the regulatory prime time frames that they've established and making decisions when they're supposed to be making decisions and not have an endless round of appeals and appeals, just make a decision because that's what regulators do. And so both the public who's protecting the environment and the developers who want to develop have a clear understanding of what the rules are and they stick to them. Okay. Michael? Great. Yeah, um, as, as you pointed out earlier, it's sort of ironic that railroads look to as a model because we have a housing problem. We don't have a lot of rental housing, you know, and that uh, people are priced out of that. And um, I agree a lot of progress has been made with our zoning, but it still serves new in the game. It's, it's only a few years old, I believe. So I think you're seeing some results, but nothing that's sort of catching up with the problem yet. So what, what additional stuff that the state is working on might help Brattleboro make more progress than it is currently? That's, you know. um, I think a lot, a lot of, we, we really need to throw more money at the problem. Um, and I can, there's no way to sugarcoat that. <laughs> um, so, if really, please don't quote that one. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, Prou Winston Prouty is interested in doing a fairly massive um, set of housing on that property. It's going to have, it's everything that, it's every best practice all put together, right? It has ready access to walking trails. It's on the bus line. It's on municipal wastewater infrastructure. They want to do a full mix of incomes um, and sizing and accessibility. And some of the properties will be owned and some of them will be rented. And we need to make sure that we have set up our funding systems so that those kinds of projects can be both supported through the permitting process and there's enough money to buy down the cost of doing that kind of development. I think that's what we're doing there. You know, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust does have a lot more projects in their pipeline. We're encouraging, we're trying to ensure that the HCB is fully funded. I'm trying to at least, I think everyone else is here, um, that VHCB is fully funded. So as projects come available for Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, they can have those happen. And then the, sort, the accessory dwelling units and rehabbing of apartments, it's sort of like, it, feels more boring and more on the edges, but does actually make a big difference, especially as, you know, so many of the homes around here are like four and five bedroom houses. Very few people want to live in four and five bedroom houses anymore. And so the more we can do to really help people break those up, I think the better off we'll be. And we are, um, we have all the planning and zoning for that and the programs for that. We just need to put more money into it. So a question. Thinking, I've been thinking ever since you mentioned it about that sort of wage suppression and having that start kind of at the state government level. Um, you know, we had a recent you know, union renegotiation for full-time employees at the library and some of the other departments in town. 
and we get told you can't use a library in New Hampshire as a comparable because it's New Hampshire, it's not Vermont. You know, you, you know, I mean, that wasn't a hard line, but you get that kind of thing, right? There's definitely this Vermont wages, you know, you can't look outside because it's not comparable. And I think, too, with the housing, right, you know, I, I have some rental. Um, I'm a landlord. We're very much dependent on our rents. Our rents are actually definitely affordable by the state standards. But, um, you know, if people's wages were higher, they'd have an easier time paying the rents. Landlords wouldn't necessarily, if they were paid better in their, because, you know, we have a lot of small landlords who are, it's a part time of what they do. It's a piece of their income, right? If, you know, their wages outside were, were more livable, they might not feel the need to raise rents as much as, you know, some of them have. Um, so, you know, it's definitely, a, I, I know it's a very complex problem, but it, I, very, I just really feel it myself very strongly. Um. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Richard, and I just wanted to uh, bring it back, the discussion to climate change. Uh, there are three of us, Barbara, John, and myself, who either, four Michael, of us. Michael, four of us. Four of us who came today who are either members of 350 Vermont or Third Act Vermont, which are both concerned with climate change. I, I, I know you guys know that, but I don't know if everybody else knows it. And uh, so I just wanted to say there is legislation, I think, in committee that's being hammered out. Um, and um, I think, I think it, they made their recommendations on Wednesday, and I haven't heard what those are yet. But regardless, uh, Vermont, right? Renewable energy standards committee? Okay. About renewable energy standards, and um, which which translates for those who don't realize it into um, getting more uh, electric power, since we're going to electrify more and more, hopefully, with both cars and heat pumps in the future. It's very important to um, make sure that that electricity uh, is not generated, say, by coal or, or uh, natural gas, which doesn't solve anything. Because, so I'm just making a pitch that the four of us are here to say, I know it's, it's not immediate the way housing is immediate or the way wages are immediate, but, um, and, and in the global scheme of things, what Vermont, I, I hate to say this as a climate activist, but what Vermont does isn't gonna make a damn bit of difference in a certain way, that's reality. But we can be a model for other states. If other states can say, well, if Vermont did it, we can do better. So I think one of the specific proposals is to um, uh, up the renewable energy standard from 10% in-state renewables to 20%, uh, either by the year 2025 or 2030. And um, that seems like a modest gain, and I just wanted to make a pitch to all of you to to support that if you can. Thank you. If, if I could also uh, just trail off of that real quick. Um, the, the other piece of that, I think, is that we also have to focus a lot on climate resiliency because you know, we, we're already seeing flooding. We're going to continue seeing more and more climate catastrophes happening, and a lot of the communities that are you know, first and most drastically affected by climate catastrophe are lower income neighborhoods, um, you know, like we saw in Barrie, for example. And, and so I, I think, you know, I don't want to go on and on about it, but I, I think focusing on our waterways is especially important. Um, and, you know, as was described earlier, our floodplains and where we're building or rebuilding um, is going to be really important for the future, too. And I think, as Wendy said earlier, the more we are, I mean, there's the being a national model, which is um, sort of a, becomes a little bit of a mixed bag in Vermont sometimes, um, our exceptionalism. But I also think the more we can move ourselves off of fossil fuel um, and onto renewable energy, the more Vermonters are going to save money um, because we won't be dependent on the ever-changing whims of multinational corporations and global Geo, you know, and geopolitics and all of that. And so I, I see that as a real piece of the puzzle towards making Vermont affordable, um, is making sure that folks can really get their energy locally. You know, just to note that we regulate the electricity pricing market. Mm -hmm. We do not regulate fossil fuel pricing and don't have a mechanism to do so. And so 
as we transition, we can also have a direct impact through our public process on what electricity rates are. Um, let's have one more comment or question from someone, and then um, we can all like mingle for another 15 minutes. And then um, at our next meeting in January, which we will announce, um, we'll do more of like a quick go around and then we'll do small groups so people can have more individual conversations. You don't have to just sit and listen. If you don't already see my, receive my emails and you want them, um, you can sign up and I then will share the sign up with Wendy and Nodder as well. And just if you want. Um, there's a sign up sheet on a table right over there. Um, they're very long detailed emails and that don't come very often. So I'm not like, I, they're not, I don't like, it's not like a DEM fundraising email that you're going to get like a really annoying email every single day. It's like every three weeks you'll get way more detail about policy than you could have possibly wanted. Does anyone who hasn't spoken yet want to say anything? Yeah. Sorry. Um, last month, my husband and I needed to have our picture taken to renew our licenses. And instead of being able to go to Dummerston five miles away, we needed to either choose Bennington or Springfield. And fortunately, our birthdays are close together. We made an appointment that was close together. We have only one car. We drove to Springfield. Though we had an appointment, we had to wait an hour. There were only two people at the window. I had a nice conversation with the woman who helped me. She said there simply is not enough staff, that the people who come to apply generally are checking the box about completing their receiving unemployment. They don't necessarily bathe or dress for a job. They're not necessarily interested in a job. They would love to have people come who would really like the job. And that there's not enough staffing at the Ford to have the Dumberston one open. And to me, this everything that we've talked about today, housing and paying and finding people who can do the work and not having to go too far to do things and all of that is in my little story about getting my picture made for I appreciate that and this the whole county delegation has actually been like fighting really hard to get that DMV reopened. They're using staffing a little bit as an excuse to not reopen it. They tried to close it a year ago. We got it kept open and then the flooding somehow became an excuse to close it again. I believe we've been promised, and Sarah Coffey, who represents Guilford and Vernon, is the chair of the Transportation Committee. Um, I believe we've been promised that they're going to reopen in January or somewhere around there. And I would say this is a good example of a way that we could perhaps shift how government operates in order to account for changing labor conditions. You know, maybe we don't actually all need to go to the DMV to have our picture taken because we are capable of taking pictures our very own selves and uploading them to computers, just as an example. Or maybe instead of having an incredibly complicated welfare apparatus that involves three meetings a week with a case manager, we could maybe just have a larger child tax credit in Vermont. So there's like ways we can reinvent Vermont to um, accommodate our labor laws and the dignity of humans who probably don't need to have a terrible picture taken by a DMV employee. Yeah. I could yeah. just add to that, yeah. that at the Dummerson DMV, I was told that the staff actually comes from Rutland on the yeah. two days, which, of course, you know, that was crazy during the, so, crazy. yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I was there the day that I went there to walk in the day they decided to close it. So that's Four yes. hours, and it took the sheriff to come and say they're not opening. <laughs> <laughs> there's right up literally the floods of the 11th. It was that Monday or whatever. It was fun. Thank you for bringing that up. I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, well, they and do. Two months to go to yeah. 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 yeah, and they do have a new online system, so you should check it out. I've actually heard good things about oh, it. Oh, I, so. I, 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 I had bought a vehicle and wanted to get it. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I went as a walk-in. Okay. Obviously, that was my experience. And then when yeah. I used the online system, yeah. I had to wait two months. The first appointment out in Springfield was two months okay. away. Okay. And then every day I would get on and check, and finally one came up. Somebody canceled, so I was able to jump on that a little sooner. Yeah. The DMV system here is terrible. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. absolutely yeah. atrocious. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I've 
lived in California and has everyone seen Beetlejuice? And there's like that all the scenes in right. the waiting room of hell, and yeah. that's like what the California DMV system is like. Yes, yeah, yeah. Liz, you have the last word. I'm going to the state forest to collect our Christmas tree for five dollars, and I just want to say that's the best bargain in Vermont. Thank you. <laughs> and the library has free COVID tests. I find that some people don't know that. And Star, what else would you like to say as we're leaving? Oh, <laughs> and I would say I hope everybody in this room has a library card um, and if not another excellent bargain like Liz's uh, because it's absolutely free if you have uh, you know everybody should have one in their stock if not <laughs> uh, so please do uh, stop and get a library card on your way out if you don't already have one and we'd be happy to tell you all the wonderful things that you can get here um, besides free COVID tests. <laughs> Thanks everyone and we'll all just burpee, we'll hear from conversations. Yeah. And happy Bobby and Sam.